at the 10th Amendment Center. Really appreciate y'all being out here, taking the time, Can't and uh, coming to learn a little bit about nullification and the 10th Amendment and, and these, uh, these very important issues. So what is this whole nullification thing all about anyway? I mean, I think if you uh, listen to a lot of people that don't know a whole lot about it, you're going to get the impression that it's all about racism and it's about slavery and I must have my gray military uniform in my closet at home. And, you know, that is not at all what it's about, not even from a historical perspective. And really, I think a lot of people overcomplicate the whole thing. You know, they act like it's some kind of legal precept that you have to have a, a, a law degree from Princeton to wrap your head around. And that's not true at all. In fact, nullification is so easy, you can do it at home. And my wife and I do it a lot because we have two 14-year-old daughters. And we have created this, this concept that we call wardrobe nullification. Okay? It works like this. And you can imagine, those of you that have teenage girls know this particularly well. Every once in a while you'll get one of those lovely young ladies will come in and she wants to push the limits of what is acceptable clothing attire. You know, possibly cut a little high or a little tight or, or whatever it is. And, and usually it's my wife who, who is the master of this. You know, as soon as she sees her come out, she'll be like, uh-uh, no, 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 young lady, you are not walking out of the house with that on. Go back and change your clothes. And boom, there you have it, nullification. It's as simple as that. Now, I love that illustration because it is that simple. It is simply saying no. It's simply saying no to the federal government when it or oversteps its, its bounds. So what we're going to do for the next 25 minutes or so is we're going to talk a little bit about the actual history of nullification. Where did this concept come from? I mean, did somebody just pull it up out of the air? Did some Civil War general come up with it so that they could protect slavery? Or, or what is this all about? We're going to look at the actual historical roots. But before we can do that, we actually have to go back even further, okay? James Madison and Thomas Jefferson were the two men who actually first articulated the principles of nullification in the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions of 1798. We're going to get into that in just a second. But actually, before we can even really think about that, we need to understand the basic structure of the government that the framers of the Constitution gave us. Because it is in that very structure of the government that we find the legitimacy of the principles of nullification. So before we can understand the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions or talk about any of these other things, we really need to understand what exactly the government is supposed to be. Because it's not anything like what we have. Now, when the framers of the Constitution met at the Philadelphia Convention right here in this lovely city, they had a lot of different ideas about what they kind of wanted to do. And there were a lot of these framers who actually wanted a very strong, centralized national government. In fact, Hamilton was, was well known as a, as a very ardent nationalist, and he actually would, wanted to have a president for life. And even James Madison, who we think of as, as being a very much of a federalist, James Madison pushed several times at the convention to give the federal government veto power over all state laws. But all of these large government, national type of, of ideas were ultimately voted away as the convention went along. And the government that we ended up with was a federal government with very specific enumerated powers with all of the rest of the powers left to the states and the people. Madison in Federalist 45 kind of spelled this out. Now you have to think of the Federalist. Federalist is kind of like that sticker that's on the side of the car when you go buy like a, a used car. You know, it kind of tells you what you're getting. That's what the Federalist Papers were supposed to be. It was kind of the explanation. Okay, this is what the Constitution is supposed to be. And in Federalist 45, Madison says the powers of the proposed Constitution delegates to the national or federal government are few and defined. Those that are left to the states and the people are numerous and indefinite. And he goes on to explain this, and he says the federal government will basically be in charge of things like making war and peace and foreign trade and treaties. The things that are left to the states and the people are those things which are important to the liberty and the prosperity and the basic running of the state. So when you look at what Madison, how he understood the Constitution, we see very clearly federal government, a very few specific powers, everything else to the states and the people. What's even more important to look at than the Federalist, and I think the key to understanding what the Constitution really is supposed to mean, 
is looking at the ratifying conventions. Because it was the ratifiers who basically said, this is what we approve and this is what we believe it to be. Now, if you look at the ratifying documents, this idea of a limited federal government becomes even more clear. And I'm going to read to you a little part of the New York ratifying document. They said, the powers of government may be reassumed by the people whensoever it shall become necessary for their happiness, that every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by the said Constitution clearly delegated to the Congress of the United States or the departments of the government thereof remains to the people of the several states or to their respective state governments to whom they may have granted the same. And that those clauses in the said Constitution which declare that the Congress shall not have or exercise certain powers do not imply that Congress is entitled to any powers not given by the said Constitution. But such clauses are to be construed either as exceptions to certain specified powers or inserted nearly for greater caution. That's the New York ratifying document. This isn't a bunch of Southern segregationists. This was the New Yorkers. And they very clearly said, first off, that we have the right as New Yorkers to reassume these powers from the federal government whenever we want to. And they went on to explain only the powers that are delegated by the Constitution can be exercised by the federal government. It's a little bit like a chess game, okay? Anybody in here play chess? Any chess players? Okay. Everybody that plays chess knows that a king can move any space one direction, right? So, obviously, a king can't move two spaces. Or a king can't skip a space and go over here. But when you play chess, you don't have to go through and list every possible illegal move. The fact that it is defined as one space in any direction excludes, by logic, every other move. This Constitution is the same way. The fact that they enumerated specific powers, which are primarily found in Article 1, Section 8, there's some other powers that are scattered throughout, it was intuitive, it was understood that by listing these powers, everything else is excluded. Okay? This is absolutely key to understanding the principles of nullification, because if we can agree that the federal government is restricted and limited to powers, well then, the next logical question is, who's going to make them, okay? There has to be some mechanism in order to keep the federal government constrained within its powers, and that's what nullification is. It was understood that the states would have the power and would serve as a check on the federal government. We don't learn this anymore because we've, we've bought into and we've been taught all the way through our elementary school and our history classes in high school that the federal government is supreme. And it is supreme, but it is only supreme within those powers that are delegated, not any old power that they decide that they want to take upon themselves. So the framers understood this, but that wasn't even enough when they put the amendments on the Constitution, they insisted that there would be some amendments that would further clarify this limited power. And you've got the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment basically said, just because we list some rights that the people retain, doesn't mean that that excludes any of the rights that are listed. And then the Tenth Amendment that we all know and love, that all of the powers that were not delegated to the federal government are left to the states and the people. So we've got to understand this, because this is the root of nullification. If the states delegated, the people delegated power through the states to the federal government, therefore, the people through their states can say, hey, federal government, you have overstepped your bounds. Okay? Well, it didn't take very long for the federal government to say, eh, let's see if we can push the limits here a little bit happened right after, within the first 10 years of, of the Republic. John Adams was president. There was a little bit of a, a quasi-war going on with France. And there was a lot of fear running through the United States that the French might invade, that we're going to have a war with France. And the federal government, being what it is, and thinking, oh, we have a good way to get some power here, manipulated that fear and passed a series of laws known as the Alien and Sedition Acts. It was the summer of 1798. The Alien and Sedition Acts were actually four separate laws. The first one wasn't particularly nefarious, but it was a very astute political move by the Federalists that were in charge. And basically what it did was it extended the amount of time that an alien had to live in the United States before being able to apply for citizenship. Now, 
The reason that they did this, really, bottom line underneath all of the political, uh, you know, the, the blah, blah, blah that they gave it, the real reason was is that most of the immigrants that were coming in tended to be pro-Republican and against the Federalist Party. So the Federalists thought, well, we'll keep them from voting for another seven years, you know. That was the, the real, real reason for that. Then they passed two more laws, which were the Alien Friends Acts and the Alien Enemies Acts. And basically, in a nutshell, what this did was it gave the president the power to look at non-citizens and say, I think you're dangerous. We're shipping you out of here. It was kind of like the NDAA of 1798 is what it was like. It gave broad sweeping judicial power to the president. And the, the Republicans looked at this and said, wait a minute. This is for the judicial system. This is, this is not a right of the president. There's no power for that. But the worst of these four laws was the Sedition Act. And it was actually the last one that was passed. And basically what the Sedition Act did was it made it illegal to criticize the federal government. It actually reads like this. It said that it was illegal and actually a misdemeanor to, fault, to use false, scandalous, or malicious writings or writings against the government of the United States or either House of Congress or the United States or the President of the United States with the intent to defame the said government. And of course it left it to the guys in power to decide what defaming the government meant. Well, can you imagine trying to run a political campaign if you weren't able to criticize the other party? The Republicans looked at this and they knew that they were in deep trouble. I mean, basically the Federalists had found a way to not only greatly expand political power, but they had found a way to lock out the opposition. And they weren't just playing around with it because as soon as this law was passed, they started arresting people. And there was actually about 25 people that were ultimately arrested under the Sedition Act. 17 verifiable indictments. And it was interesting that one of the people that was actually arrested under the Sedition Act was Benjamin Franklin Bach. Anybody knew who Benjamin Franklin Bach was? 